those who are just joining us, uh, welcome. Uh, we'll be starting in a few minutes. Minister Prof. Bang Rojanagoro, it's good to see you again. Okay, good to see you again. Baik, Alhamdulillah. Great that you're able to join us, uh, uh, Minister. We also have uh, sure. all the speakers, uh, panel speakers lined up here. I got also the moderator from the Mona, from Seattle, Mbak Wina from New York, Mas Cipta uh, from Singapore, as well as our uh, great moderator, Head of America's Region at GIPA. In New York juga Arki. Ijin mulai langsung aja kalau begitu, um, Pak Probambang. Silakan, silakan. Hear me over to you. So good morning, good afternoon, and evening, esteemed participants, ladies and gentlemen, adik-adik, welcome, selamat datang. My name is Hilmi. I'm GIPA's head of Indonesia, and it is my pleasure to welcome all of you to GIPA's latest Going Global series, predicting your roles in artificial intelligence and machine learning. Two rules before we start. For those of us in the panelist section, please keep your mic muted throughout the session unless prompted otherwise. For the participants, you'll have an opportunity to ask a question live. Please submit your questions through the Q&A box with your full name, company or university, and location. If the time permits, the moderator will then give you access so you'll be able to turn on your video and ask your question live. We are delighted to be joined tonight by His Excellency, Professor Bamang Brojonegoro, Minister of Research and Technology, head of the Research and Innovation Agency of the Republic of Indonesia, who will be providing opening remarks for today's session. Welcome, Your Excellency. Thank you for having all your support thus far. We're glad you could join us live. Tonight, we are also um, supposed to be joined by His Excellency Muhammad Lutfi, Indonesian Ambassador to the United States, um, who unfortunately um, is unable to join us live due to last minute scheduling conflict, but will still be giving his closing remarks pre-recorded. In his place, we would like to welcome um, and extend a warm welcome to Bapak Iwan Freddy, Deputy Chief of Mission. Selamat datang, Bapak Iwan. Today, we have an exciting session lined up with three Indonesian professionals. Um, Chip. Cipta Hermawan from Google Pay in Singapore, Kartina Saifuddin from City in New York. These are three young professionals who have distinguished themselves in the field of artificial intelligence and machine learning. The session will be moderated by Arki Maraksa, PhD. Within GIPA, Arki is our head of Americas and head of the Center of Excellence for Professional Development. Professionally, Arki works as director of strategic initiatives and model governance in American Express New York. We would also like to thank our great supporting partners from IPA USA, um, IPA Singapore and Pepe Dunia for their support. I shall be recognizing them in alphabetical order of their organizations. Um, first of all, Team IPA USA, who is represented by far too many people here tonight to mention individually. Leonard Eggert, Executive Director of IPA Singapore. Oirul Anam, Global Coordinator of Pepe Dunia. Umar Alatas, Secretary General of Pepe Dunia. James Wiguna, Treasurer Pepe Dunia. I'm immensely proud to say that we are joined by over 900 students and young professionals from 24 countries across 120 cities in every continent except Antarctica, with countries as far away as Norway, as near as Papua New Guinea. Now first on our agenda tonight will be a photo session, so may I request all our panelists to have their videos on and smile for the camera. Rachel, um, on to you. Perhaps we can stop the screen share for a bit. Hi all, so I'll be taking a picture. I'm going to count down to three um, and please all smile for the camera. One, two, three. Sorry, someone just turned on their camera, so I'll do it again. One, two, three. Great, thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Now um, for our second agenda, um, it will be an introduction to GIPA by Stephen Marcelino. Stephen drives GIPA's strategic partnership to promote business and investment links between Indonesia 
and overseas partners. He took up this global role after co-founding the Indonesian professional hub in the UK called Yipa UK, where he was executive director between 2015 to 2020. Currently, Stephen is ASEAN Capital Markets Director at Accenture UK, a global management consulting firm. He promotes financial market development across Southeast Asia, working with FS regulators to allow member states to drop more capital to accelerate infrastructure development. Prior to Accenture, Stephen worked in the Prime Brokerage Division at UBS Bank in London. Without further delay, the floor is yours, Stephen. Thank you. Thank you, Hilmi. Thanks for the kind introductions there. Hello, and good afternoon from London. Uh, I'm Stephen Marcelino. I'm chairman of KIPA, Global Indonesia Professional Association, um, as well as I'm client engagement lead at Accenture UK. I'm delighted to see over 900 of you joining in. Um, from Indonesian professionals as well as Indonesian students studying at top universities across 24 countries and America, Americas, EMEA region and Asia Pacific regions. Also good to see uh, some leaders from our local professional hubs earlier on. Um, we have representatives from IPA New York, uh, Early, IPA Boston, uh, Representative Brandon, IPA DC, we have Harry Sagama, IPA SF, Toshi, also uh, we have a lot more um, leaders from local professional hubs in UK, Berlin, Toronto, Norway, Switzerland, Hong Kong, Singapore, and Australia. It's great to see many of you. We're all virtually connected here. This is the, the wonder of technology, which is great. As a global secretariat, GIPA aims to promote business and investment links overseas through highly talented Indonesian professionals uh, and executives working abroad, a true partner for Indonesia's economic diplomacy and human capital development. He by itself represents Indonesian professionals and executives uh, working across G20 and ASEAN uh, who are within eight industry groups from financial services, health, life sciences, technology, professional services, international organizations, industrials, infrastructure resources, energy and creative media. Our capabilities are focused around three COEs or center of excellences. The first center of excellences on business investment links where we work together with our global partners in order to promote the right Indonesia story abroad uh, from our series of emerging Indonesia series. And secondly, we have Center of Excellence on Public Relations Advocacy, where we captured and we re uh, advocate for the interests and concerns of Indonesia professionals and executives working abroad. A third center of excellence is probably one of the most important one, and I think it's quite timely with this event, is the Center of Excellence Professional Development, headed by our moderator of the day, Arki uh, Maraksa, uh, where he will do the open setting and tell you a little bit more about professional development. So for those of you who join uh, for the first time to our uh, GIPA Going Global series, uh, you, you should really stay tuned to our uh, social media channels where you can hear all about the latest initiative from GIPA. And for those of you Indonesian professionals who have not yet connected to your closest local professional hubs, some of the cities and countries I mentioned, there will be a feedback form at the end of the event where you can fill out and then you, we can try to get you connected with relevant uh, local professional hubs where you live. But if you and your team is interested to initiate a new local professional hubs, uh, please also get in touch with our Secretary General, uh, Stephen Mijaya. Now, we are very honored to have a special guest that will um, share some keynote remarks here. I'm pleased to invite Minister Bambang Brojanagoro. He is the Minister of Research and Technology, uh, Head of National Research of Innovation Agency. He took up this role since at the start of President Jokowi's second term back in October 2019. Uh, previously, uh, Professor uh, Bambang is uh, served in the cabinet as Minister of National Development Planning of Indonesia. He was also previously Finance Minister of Indonesia, uh, also previously Deputy of Finance Minister in the second United Indonesia cabinet. Uh, Minister Bambang Rujunogoro completed his undergraduate uh, degree at, uh, in economics at University of Indonesia. He then studied for a master degree at the University of Illinois. Uh, so he's a UK, uh, he's a US alumni. He then completed his doctoral program at the university in 1997. It's great to have a US alumni joining with us today. Uh, Minister Pamrujanagoro, over to you. Okay. Thank you, uh, Stephen. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Very good evening, good morning, and good afternoon 
to all participants, Ambassador Muhammad Lutfi, Deputy Chief Mission, as well as all diplomats from the Indonesian Embassy at Washington DC, distinguished speakers, participants, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, I would like to extend my gratitude to the Global Indonesia's Professional Association, or GIPA, PA, who has invited me to join this event. I also congratulate all the organizers involved for staging this event. Currently, we are facing various potential and challenges, such as Industrial Revolution 4.0, and at the same time, unfortunately, is COVID-19 pandemic. This condition has provided opportunities for all parties to strive harder in carrying out research and innovation to come up with the solution. Innovation through an innovation-driven economy paradigm is the key towards Indonesia's vision to be a high-income country in 2045. Therefore, in this era, we are required to promote technological innovation for the prosperity of humankind and to contribute to economic development. Ministry of Research and Technology, National Research and Innovation Agency, acts as the integrator by formulating policies in order to create a conducive innovation ecosystem. To create this ecosystem, we invite the collaboration of Triple Helix, which is government, academician or researchers, and industry. Our duty is to coordinate and conduct efforts on research, development, systematic review, and implementation of the innovation. Indonesia's priorities in research and technology are elaborated in 2017-2045 National Research Master Plan, or in Bahasa RERN, to streamline the country's long-term R&D needs. It covers four main aspects, which are appropriate technology, value added and commercialization, import substitution and local content, and frontier technology. The National Research Master Plan was then followed by the development of 2020-2024 National Research Priority, covering nine sectors, food, energy, health, transportation, engineering, defense and security, maritime affairs, social humanities, and multidisciplinary or cross-sectoral. Our ministry has 12 out of 49 National Research Priorities, namely flat plate ship, rice corn meat, EV battery, electrical vehicle battery, original Indonesian modern medicine and stem cell, remote sensing satellite, food packaging, disaster management, and research on social change in digital community. At the moment, four of them, four of them are proposed as national strategic, national strategic uh, projects or in Bahasa called PSN. Those four are amphibious aircraft and 219A. This is transport aircraft with optimal composite technology for waters in Indonesia. The aircraft is used for various purposes, such as passenger aircraft, for cargo, for search and rescue, for disaster, and for an ambulance. Second, the Elang Hitam drone, or basically the drone for military. This is a medium altitude long endurance, crewless aircraft. This aircraft is capable of flying 24 hours and can be equipped with weapons. Third, Qataris Merah Putih. The technology processing palm oil into gasoline, diesel, and after. Fossil fuel content can be replaced 100% by biohydrocarbons from palm oil using katalis merah putih. Fourth, salt for industry. An integrated industrial salt factory with a capacity of 40,000 ton per year. The factory is integrated with a byproduct processing plants, salting liquid waste. On the other hand, especially in this pandemic time, to accelerate the handling of COVID-19 pandemic, our ministry also has conducted several research and innovation programs with multidisciplinary collaboration among unique government, university, non-ministerial government institution or research institution, industry, professional association, and diaspora. 
I proudly announced that through Research and Innovation Consortium for COVID-19, we were able to launch more than 60 COVID-19 research innovation products, such as PCR test kit, rapid test, detection tool through exhale brain, named Genos, Genos, and then autonomous ultraviolet mobile robot convalescent serum, mobile lab for biosafety lab 2, ventilator, and various innovative products. In addition, we are currently developing Indonesia's COVID-19 vaccine, a virus-based vaccine circulating in Indonesia, namely vaccine Merah Putih. Furthermore, we also utilize digital healthcare innovation in handling COVID-19, such as mobile, mobile COVID-19 track to mitigate the potential and risk of doctors being exposed to the virus and artificial intelligence based COVID-19 detection system to show COVID-19 diagnosis. The use of artificial intelligence is able to drive the technological development of a country for its strategic purpose. Artificial intelligence also will help to enhance the effectiveness and productivity of an organization, as well as give insight to assist the decision-making process, both operational and strategic. Therefore, we have developed the Artificial Intelligence National Strategy, or in Bahasa, Strategi Nasional Kecerdasan Artificial, as the direction and guidance of our national policy. It is expected to answer various problems in the aspects of products, process, and cognitive insights in Indonesia. The development of artificial intelligence technology in Indonesia consists of several programs, such as providing shared infrastructure and platform for artificial intelligence and machine learning through mapping and standardizing interconnected scheme between private communication infrastructure, public and strategic M2M or IoT, Internet of Things. And then researching on the concept of render token or application of shared infrastructure. And third, developing Indonesian National Artificial Intelligence Supercomputer Center. In addition, we also plan to establish the Artificial Intelligence Council as an arbitrator between producers and consumers' data. The five priorities of our artificial intelligence national strategy, first, medical services, second, bureaucratic reformation, third, education and research, fourth, for food security, as well as fifth, mobility and smart cities. Thus, in the process of pres the, the presence of professionals working in the technology sectors, like most of you, are strongly needed for conducting the national research priorities, the handling of COVID-19 pandemic, and most importantly, in artificial intelligence national strategy to realize the digital transformation in Indonesia, which is important factor to shift Indonesia's economic paradigm from resource-driven economy to be innovation-driven economy. Collaboration is very much needed in this unprecedented time. It is able to provide opportunities both to create new knowledge and to increase the impact of research and innovation for humankind and welfare. So, on this occasion, I would like to encourage young Indonesians to take a career in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, or as you know, STEM, as Indonesia's economic structure will shift into innovation base in the future. The potential and expertise of STEM enthusiasts in Indonesia are urgently needed now and more than ever. They will become enablers to create many more innovation in the future and to overcome modern challenges. We hope that many more collaboration among government, academicians, and industry, particularly in artificial intelligence and machine learning, opens up new avenues for more accountable and efficient mechanism for productivity and downstreaming research and innovation. Thank you very much. Stay safe and good evening. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you.
proper bang. Excellent, uh, uh, excellent remarks there, especially towards the end. I really underlined the importance of collaboration. It's a really call to actions for many Indonesian professionals and executives working in technology sector, which is quite a, a growing number of them, especially to support the Artificial Intelligence National Strategy and AI Council, the AIC, that uh, Cambridge Tech Green is, is per heading. I, I certainly would also love to follow up further and the KIPA team as well as the uh, hub leaders where technology is quite, quite strong here. Uh, perhaps, you know, this is something that will just take away. Uh, Pro um, we also been uh, notified that unfortunately you have another engagement, so you may not be able to stay. Uh, throughout the event, uh, which is uh, which is fine, but this is certainly a message that resonates with many of our speakers. And on that note, perhaps um, again, we would like to thank uh, yourself and supporting this event. And I'll then pass on to Arki Maraksa uh, to continue the professional development here and introducing our mid of the event. Arki, over to you. Thank you, Stephen. Hi, everyone uh, from New York. So as the lead for GIPA's uh, Center for Excellence for Professional Development, basically we focus specifically on improving the human capital development aspect of Indonesia. And there are certain ways that we can do this. And th basically in the next three to five minutes, I would like to level set the expectations and the goals that we're trying to achieve and particularly going through this event and, and what do we want to uh, obtain. I think. What's interesting, uh, first thing that we've observed as the as the GIPA team, as well as inputs from uh, various professional hubs around the world, is that Indonesia by 2030 is expected to become one of the top five economies. Uh, the, the problem is, though, however, in in 2030, uh, there are some uh, there are some researches or uh, the publications that have delineated that Indonesia may face a shortage of 3.8 million of skilled workers. If this is the case, it will lead to around $440 billion of economic losses. And, and this is mainly driven by a shortage in talent pipeline. And another thing that we've observed is that Indonesia is lacking when it comes to global leaders. Out of hundreds of many Fortune 500s or global companies, uh, rarely there are Indonesian leaders or leading in this particular company as executives. So I think what we want to promote and we, what we want to inspire is that for students and professionals around the world to, to increase their global exposure. Uh, otherwise, we may face some challenges in the future where the, the talent shortage will widen and, and increase. So from our end, if Indonesia has uh, a talent gap, like what should we do in terms of uh, closing this or narrowing this down? So if we go to the next slide. So what we want to do is that we have the Professional Development Center of Excellence and our objective is actually to share the best in class human capital. And, and this initiative is done in two folds. And I think uh, if you hit next on the slide here. Uh, and the, yes, thank you. So one thing that we wanna focus on is to push students to become top professionals. And then and the next level is that we want to push professionals to become top executives. So what does it mean actually if, you, if we are doing this? I, we want everybody to think about their careers globally. I think in our philosophy is that we want to uh, help everybody to increase their experience that adds value, uh, you obtain best practice, and it's on par with the global industry standards. And I think for everybody overseas, uh, especially for students overseas, young professionals overseas, start thinking about uh, navigating and charting your careers in the global uh, level. And, and we want to improve your aspects of, of talent, expertise, character, and leadership. And I think this is what we want to nurture. And eventually, if we are going to contribute back to Indonesia, then there is some opportunity in, in the future to, to be able to do so. So the program uh, today actually focuses on, on improving uh, uh, these, these professional development aspect. And, and what's interesting is that how can GIPA and also the professional hub do that? And if we don't mind going to the next slide. Like, how can we do it? And let's go on to the next one. So GIPA and also the professional hub, we have a relationship uh, with various cities where there are 
thousands of Indonesian professionals. And what's interesting is that many of them are willing to share their experience and expertise uh, to all of us. And, and this is what we want to do. We want to be able to extract the, the talent, knowledge, and, and share the expertise across the world. Uh, and as you see, like many of the hub leaders are here in the call today and also the speakers today are coming in from various overseas cities. And we want to ensure that we can create some interesting program that will inspire everybody. So I think I also want to point out that what are we doing is has been proven in, in each city. We have done a various initiatives such as knowledge sharing, career coaching. We've been helping students and and I think particularly in the in the local professional hubs, they've been doing a lot of those and, and it seems to be a, a direction that's that's been working and we want to scale it up at the global level. Why don't we just share the collective knowledge that we have around the world and, and bring it back to Indonesia? And I think I want to point out something important as well. This is a 10, 20 year initiative and, and many of the professionals are really have truly care about Indonesia and I think in the future they will certainly uh, be able to return to Indonesia or contribute back to Indonesia. But I think lastly that I want to point out is that uh, through this event we will definitely share with you a lot of the secrets, technique into becoming a global leader, into, into achieving your goals in, in working in a global environment. And But first things first, let's do a quick deep dive on what is the topic today on artificial intelligence. If you don't mind going to the next slide. And I think let's, let's skip this one. So why is artificial intelligence and machine learning is relevant? I think uh, one thing that I wanna point out, this is a $13 trillion industry. Uh, it, it will increase the output of the, of the economy by, globally by 13 trillion. That's a huge number there. Uh, in addition to that, what's interesting is that 42% of global companies actually consider AI talent is lacking. And this is an interesting thing I, from the point of view of going into careers in AI or from the point of view of what uh, the AI industry is going to be in, it's going to be very big. And, and I think it's already big. It, it has already created a lot of values uh, to people who are working there, but there's going to be more opportunities. And it's definitely something to consider for everybody who is interested to, to, to start a career or, or to, to, to go into a new, a new areas of, of work that, that is basically uh, on the edge of a new technology. I think, I think it's, it's a very, very interesting and timely topic that uh, we should discuss. And, and if you don't mind going to the next slide, And what's interesting is that artificial intelligence and machine learning has actually been used in many industries. I think almost all industries have adopted AI, telecom, finance, energy, and, and a lot of the use cases that you've seen are the things that you are, you've actually used it before, like uh, 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 food delivery services, uh, AI is used for uh, your, your maps, like Waze and Google Maps, and there are many other use cases as well that that it is basically evolving and you may not realize that there's a lot of brilliant people who are driving these algorithms and driving these models to, to ensure that your life is easier and, and it brings value to a lot of these companies. So let's go on to the next slide. Yep, so I think what I want to point out is that let's, that's basically to level set the, the expectation of the discussion and, and bring it, but definitely I will also ask the, our experts here in the panel to talk about the the importance of AI and define what is AI. So with that, and let's jump into the discussion. So today we, are, we have three very, very interesting and unique speakers. Uh, I think I'm gonna do a quick introduction of, uh, for each one of them, and then uh, I'll pass the, the floor to them. But uh, first things first, uh, we have Kartina Saifuddin, or uh, can be, can be uh, or Vista Dipangile Wina. Uh, she's a senior uh, data management lead uh, analyst at Citigroup. And basically what Wina does is that she works on uh, automating data collection, uh, creating reports and correlating data. Very, very specific to for the data part of AI. And I think uh, another thing that's interesting about Wina is that she also likes to bake uh, and she makes really, really good baklava. Mm -hmm. uh, the second speaker that we have is Chipta, uh, who's working at Google Pay Singapore. Uh, formerly, he used to also work in Google New York. Uh, so Chipta, basically his entire career has been focusing a lot on uh, computer science and, and, and machine learning. So he has his bachelor's degree from Columbia University, specializing in machine learning. And then uh, recently, or I think two years ago, he actually completed his master's degree in data science from New York University. Uh, so Chipta is in Google Pay Singapore. Uh, I think 
one thing that I know uh, Orange Chief is that he likes to eat, so I think that's an interesting thing. Uh, and lastly, we have another speaker, Mona, uh, or Mona Ris uh, Nurfita Mona Riska. So she's based in uh, Seattle. She's a data scientist working in Microsoft. And interestingly, she's working in cybersecurity, uh, creating models uh, to detect ransomware attacks. And I think being in the uh, West Coast, Pacific Northwest, uh, Mona, I think uh, hiking is definitely a fun thing to do, yeah? So to that end, actually, I'm going to bring in the speakers. Actually, if you don't mind, uh, we can start with Wina. Maybe, Wina, you can tell us a little bit about yourself like for, for a minute or two and, and what is your day-to-day -day activity at the office. Yeah, sure. And thank you so much for the very brief introduction, uh, Arki. So I'm Kartina Saifuddin. I've been in the financial industry for nine and a half years already, and it's split into seven years in risk management and then uh, two and a half years uh, been doing data management, which is highly touching artificial intelligence. The data management, uh, the relationship between data management and the artificial intelligence is like a, works symbiotically. So, in order for an artificial intelligence to work good, you have to have good data, good data management. And in order for the data management to work uh, as expected, to have to have a great outcome for the goals that we want to achieve, such as the automation of a regulatory reporting or a visualization of a dashboard for uh, to get an actionable plan, uh, you do need a good data and, uh, and artificial intelligence. So it's a hand-to-hand -hand and what works right now in order for that outcome to be good, you need to have that machine learning, deep learning uh, to get the right data, good data quality, whether it's a good uh, accuracy, completeness, and valid value. So what company does is in order to get this good machine learning algorithm or deep learning algorithm, uh, they onboard data scientists. It's really uh, not a lot of talents there, not a lot of uh, supply of data science. So uh, they onboard as, as not much as possible, but uh, on board the the it's uh, co it co it's costly because they 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 make uh, good um, in terms of the um, they good make good salary basically. So, but what happens is after the data science came on board, they, they start doing this algorithm. They look at the outcome. Then why is this not? Uh, why is the result not intuitive with the condition outside and uh, what we trace it back is it's really the data so when you're in a national in a multinational companies the company's been established for a long time very likely and there's is a research for this is that uh, your data is sloppy and so what happens is okay now you have to use that resource for uh, the, the machine learning algorithm you take it back to the data management and then you start cleaning the data, those data, which is uh, which is, which works better because before that you do all these manual interventions, uh, manual manual uh, data management, and that's just not going to work. It's really prone to issues. So that's what my team does, where we go back to take this resource data science uh, algorithm, scope it down a little, and just focus on cleansing of data. Uh, look at the not just the completeness, but how that correlates with, with each other, uh, the consistency of the data, and then start using that into the regulatory reporting and then dashboard, uh, creating the dashboard. And based on that dashboard, the business can look into, okay, this makes sense. Now let's do ABC as an action item uh, for the company. So in the day today, uh, that's roughly an overview how what my team and I are doing uh, in the data management and artificial intelligence. Okay. Yeah. 
Thanks, thanks, Vina. I think that's very, very insightful. I, and and what one thing that's interesting is that when people think about artificial intelligence and machine learning, they focus on the cool modeling side, that making prediction. Yes. But they're not. Many people are not aware, and we're definitely going to talk a lot more on that. Mm-hmm. That a lot of the time is actually spent on the data prep and data cleaning. That's like an immense amount yeah. of work there. So with that, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna call in Chipta now. So Chipta, tell us a little bit about yourself, like uh, in a quick minute or two, and and what do you do on a day to day activity at Google? Okay, sure. Hi. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Arki, for introducing me. Uh, it's an honor to be here. So uh, my name is Chipta Herwana. I've been working in Google for about seven plus years. Uh, grad- graduated from Columbia, did my master's at NYU. Uh, most recently in the past two years, moved to Singapore to be part of like the Google, pay, the growing Google Pay team here in Singapore. We've uh, Recent, recently, in the past few months, we've been ramping up this like uh, smart steam inside Google Pay, which I am a part of. Uh, and our job really is to basically be a bridge between like the ML domain knowledge that we have. We've com- we've uh, collected engineers with like that with uh, knowledge on like how to build ML models, how to kind of scale ML models to to be to you know there's like this thing called google scale and and, and we we really do mean that like how, how to scale this ml model to like google scale uh between from uh, within us and uh our clients which are, are like in-house product teams so so teams would come to us or we come to them saying like hey uh we have this idea of like an ml problem a problem that we can solve using data science or ml might be how would you like to work with each other? And then what we would do is we do the whole pipeline, right? We would start with like the in- investigation of what, okay, how does your, uh, what is your, what is your objective? Uh, what are your metrics? And then we can say like, what, okay, what data do you have to, to, that we can, that we can work on to start applying our algorithms or models and do they, do they, is there a match? Is there like, are there modeling techniques that we can use that are, that are appropriate for the given problem? And if, we find like yeah there's a good opportunity here then we also do the the ml side implementation of like okay let's this is how this is how what we expect from you guys like how like can you give us this all the streams of this data and then we can join them we can build data sets out of them train build like the, the whole training pipeline serving and quality management pipelines to basically turn the ml idea into reality that helps actually helps users at, at the end so that's kind of like how uh, in in short like what i do kind of in in general terms uh, as arki said i do like to eat uh, what he conveniently forgot uh, forgot to tell is that who i usually eat with when i was in new york <laughs> <laughs> i think i think we should focus on the, the machine learning instead of the personal uh, okay. science of that. <laughs> all right, but, all right. but yeah it's kind of embarrassing eating like three kilograms of steak right the, a couple uh. of years ago <laughs> so anyway uh Chipta, before before i jump to mona actually one thing that i want to ask you is that uh i mm-hmm. think one thing that we haven't done is actually describing what is actually artificial intelligence and machine learning. So if you don't mind, like just giving a high level overview, like what it is, what's what's the difference between AI, ML, and traditional uh, modeling using traditional statistical method? Like, like if you can share that, that'll be great. Okay. So AI, ML, uh, I guess we can, let's illustrate this with a, with the concrete example. Like let's say like a, like a self-driving car, uh, for example, like you. Self-driving cars have cameras, and these cameras have to like basically like pedestrians walking around them, next to them, like in front of them, and they have to be sure to kind of like highlight when the pedestrian is right in front of the car for obvious reasons. Um, and then, so if without AI, right, how would you actually do something like that? So uh, with traditional programming, what okay, how a computer reads or sees an image is like it's just a table of colors. So bintik ini di sini warnanya ini, bintik ini di sini warnanya itu. And so it's really hard to tell a computer what a face looks like, or what the human head or a human body looks like in in those terms. So that that's like the big problem that has been plaguing people for like the and these kinds of problems appear everywhere. Things like machine translation, listening to audio, and like text to speech, uh, speech to text, stuff. So all these problems that as humans, we don't really think about it because we uh, we just learn it from birth. 
but that's that's kind of like the process that we are trying to to replicate with computers with machine learning techniques right so so we would just give the you uh, the the algorithm examples so ini gambar ini orangnya di sini dan sini ini gambar ini enggak ada orang sama sekali dan and lot many many pictures like that and then the idea is like how do we tell this computer to like process this info so that it can learn and generalize to new images that it the model itself hasn't seen so you how do how do you tell a computer to learn what a face looks like and that's how that's how that's basically in a nutshell what ai and ml is trying to do and with ml the foundation of that how is basically statistics like we use statistical techniques and we just amplify them uh, to become like stores of information uh, and that's what we call like an ml model in in general interesting uh chipta it's yeah. still very complicated but uh -huh. I, i think i think to to recap like traditional statistics and compared to ai like i think it's augmented right with with certain right. algorithms that people have developed mm -hmm. so you can just in a way in in a secara kasarnya gitu you can plug in yeah. data and they can identify the patterns that that cannot yeah. be seen before right yeah. uh and and while while the original like traditional modeling misalnya pakai regression atau ordinary mm -hmm. square you actually have to impute the the data first and okay you you have to do the the i mean to, yes. you still do the same with with ai mm -hmm. tapi, tapi with with ai is is more amplified it's more it's more it's 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 uh, apa uh, the 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 degree of of how you can ex mm -hmm. extra, extra extract the information is is much larger and yeah. uh so yeah, i think i think i think it's that's great uh and with that i think let's go on to our next uh, uh speaker uh mona uh so you're you're in microsoft right mona and what's interesting is that i think you're one of the rare uh, professionals that i've met uh indonesian working in cyber security mm -hmm. uh usually it's the other way around you know indonesia can have cyber security attack but you're like actually protecting all of us uh so can you tell us a little bit about your work yeah sure um so hello everyone i am mona but you can just call me mona and uh, i've been working as a data scientist um since 2015 i started in a startup in indonesia um it was self stock back then um changed name to Sorabel and I think it, it was it was gone now sadly um so I was helping marketing back then um as a remote data scientist from here um the United States and I thought wow this is this is really interesting I have to deep dive into this world so um I decided to go to grad school in 2016-2017 um in New York University as well but I take urban informatics so it is a data scientist very specific for urban problems um and after that i got a job as a data scientist as well we moved data scientist again because i have to move from new york to seattle um so i got a job in arcades it is an engineering firm so i did a lot of uh, data science uh, for uh, urban planning um, transportation and stuff like that and then i thought um i have to then move on because actually it's very tiring to go back and forth from New York to Seattle and uh finally I got a job in Microsoft um in the early earlier this year before the pandemic um and I am now working for cybersecurity so if you think about cybersecurity the way um we or the, the antivirus um catch the attack easily um we have fingerprint we have sha1 and um back then uh, in the glory days uh, we usually just check the sha1 check the fingerprint whether this is a fingerprint of a virus or not and then if it is a virus and then we block it but nowadays people are smarter um they don't uh, they don't use the the known fingerprint for virus they generate a lot of new fingerprints and sometimes it doesn't involve uh files at all so we can't really rely on the the fingerprint um so that's what my team is doing right now so we're we're trying to figure out the attacks um based off of the other attributes not only uh, the files itself because sometimes it doesn't have files but from the other uh stuff like for example the command line or the processes and stuff like that so that's that's what i'm doing right now thank you Mona. that's that's mm -hmm. very interesting so i think i do have one quick question for you like are you when it comes to like you using personal computer and password like are you very very like meticulous now like creating password or like managing your personal information 
I am. I am. Uh, and one quick tip: um, if 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 you can um, if you can do logger password um, rather than uh, just like small small six seven digit password that has uh, numbers or capital letters whatever. So if you can um, create one full sentence for your password, and it is harder for the machine to figure out. Jadi passwordnya jangan ini ya, jangan ulang tahun saya atau nama papa mama ya. <laughs> no. I think that's a, that's a bad idea. Um, so okay, let's uh, let's continue the discussion, and it's pretty interesting right now. Like I think 10 minutes into the the talk, we already have like more than 10 questions that has been posted by the by the audience. So I think for everybody, we'll we'll definitely go through each one of the questions uh, as time permits, and and we also have uh, uh, people who have volunteered to ask live questions, and and I think we'll start doing that in a couple of minutes, but. I think I think before that, uh, I I would like to ask the panelists uh, uh, probably just to give a little bit of insights. Like uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, statistics is not an easy topic, right? It's it's something that's actually relatively difficult to learn uh, compared to uh, other subjects. Uh, but but obviously there's definitely a method to to learn. Like maybe if if uh, perhaps like uh, one of you can can share gimana sih caranya improve your technical skills uh, like quickly on a high level gitu. Maybe I can I can start with Cipta gitu. What, what do you think Cipta? Mm-hmm. Like kalau misalnya mau belajar and then and then you're like uh, you're really new like you've never touched this before. Yeah. What do you recommend? Well, I think for me personally, uh, I'm like a hands-on learner. Jadi So I usually like to learn by just like doing, learning by doing. So uh, trying to, <clears throat> rather than trying to read data science books or like, or like reading about theory, I would just like to try to find a problem that I'm interested in. And just try to kind of like uh, do the do the modeling aspect of it. So so how do how do I get the data? How do I process the data? How do I how do I build a model? And that's that usually highlights like where i'm lacking the most and like where do i need to 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 look more uh, so okay, uh, resources like kaggle you know, it's very very helpful for me to kind of like brush up on data science and machine learning techniques rather than okay, uh, i know people get yeah some people can read paper like research papers right like that but usually i need like some sort of problem context to kind of like apply it to. That, that makes sense, yeah. And, and I think it's much better uh, you you apply it langsung. Yeah. Uh, reading paper is tough, yeah. Baca baca formula ma, for, and all the equation, oh, yeah. like it's it's so painful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, bisa bikin tidur itu. Um, <laughs> any anything from uh, maybe from Mona, like uh, how did you pick up your your skills in uh, modeling or AI? Yeah. Um, so initially, I remember uh, when I was started, um, I. I studied by myself, so I look at um, the Coursera or other um, online learning courses. Uh, but it wasn't it wasn't enough for me, so that's why I I went to grad school because I did a structured uh, structured kind of curriculum or structured way to learn the things. But that's that's just being if if um, but I, th- I don't think people don't really need um, master at all. If you uh, if you want to, you can do online learning. Just, just fine, I thought. Um, but then one thing that helped me the most, uh, say Mas Cipta, is um, b- building a portfolio. So by learning by doing, by creating mini projects, and that way we can we can learn about the um, the machine learning. But not only that, we learn about how we can formulate the problems, how we can choose the problems, how we can get the data how we can apply the model to the, the, the data, is the model relevant to the data at all, how we can communicate that to other people by, I don't know, creating blog posts, creating um, paper, not not paper, but like blog posts um, or anything like that. I think that, that helps me so much. Okay, thank thank you, thank you, Mona. That's uh, very very helpful. You get gitu. So I think uh, I think uh, we'll we'll go on with one more question and we'll we'll start opening up to the floor. You gitu. This this is one thing that I think a lot of people are interested to ask. Um, working in a global multinational, uh, especially in this field and very cutting edge, uh, I probably I'd like to to ask a question gitu. Okay, apa sih yang what 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 do you need to have like uh, on top of your technical skill set? Um, 
uh, maybe like what when you're when you're looking for a candidate, and I'm pretty sure many of you have also interviewed candidates yeah, uh, for for jobs. You know, like what do you look for? Uh, maybe we, you can share a little bit on on both. Um, uh, apa namanya, uh, both technical and, and non-technical. Maybe I'll, I'll I'll try to bring in Wina on this one. Yeah. Wina, what's your what's your thought? Yeah, and I'm actually passionate about this topic because once you bring in the right person to the job, then things after that will move smoothly. Uh, what I do when looking for a top candidate is uh, there are two types of uh, interview questions that I pose. Uh, the first one is the leadership questions, and then the second one is uh, more on the problem solving or the uh, technical skills. So leadership. So what is it that I look for in a in a person from their leadership traits? Uh, the first one is willingness to learn so when someone is just from some from fresh graduate or someone who actually does not have any background in data scientists but I can see in their resume that they've been doing lots of courses in data science then actually that actually in, I'm actually intrigued with that per, to that person uh, finding out more about them so the when you come from an uh, undergrad background, your world is so ideal. It's very, uh, it's very black and white. But in reality, when you come to the job, it's not, it's nothing like that. And I'm pretty sure Arthur you can um, speak to that. But so willingness to learn is very important because you cannot close your mindset. You have to have an open mindset, and then uh, knowing that you come here, you're starting fresh, uh, knowing that what is it that you have to do in order to be successful in this role. You need to talk to people which means their communication skills and then how you ask those questions and then uh, second of all making uh, the adaptability so adaptability especially in the machine learning or artificial intelligence it's, it's a crucial competence because your world five or six years of uh, the the ilmu yang that you got from university five six years ago is could be obsolete today right and that's what i experienced so you have to keep on learning and then uh second of all is uh, the from the so that's the willingness to learn and then the communication skill so that's the top two questions and usually how i get that sense is through questions such as stories in say for example in your your undergrad or graduate studies tell me a story where you work on a project and it failed and then what did you learn what would you do be doing differently and with that question you can actually tell all those components so and then the second one is the technical skills or the problem solving skills so if i know this person's been uh, they have uh, like our experience, so I'm taking R because that, like, that's more what I'm familiar with. So I get question. I ask questions about okay, what kind of uh, if I have this problem, what kind of library you'll be using, and then uh, what do you do? Okay, you have these sets of data. How do you combine them? What do you what functions do you use? And then if that person is really that they are able, they are able to um, answer all those questions, and then I take it up to the much uh, more on okay how do you com connect between uh, like this and then our Hadoop for example so that's mostly what it is like I have a colleague who likes to interview with me and his question is really more on the problem solving and com communication skills like how teach me how to make an omelet or um, and uh, like if how do you how do you explain uh, how YouTube works to an 80 year old person so something like that because that will tell us a lot it's not really straight like uh, black and white whether okay uh, what is your what is your strength what is your weakness people still do that but sometimes in stories you will tell get to have that sense so when you come to an interview prepare those stories and then make don't make it the same stories at a time because that from an interviewer point of view you get to see okay this person actually prepared for the interview with all these stories so that's that's how i do it 
I think I think what's interesting is uh, communication is very important. I mean, ujung ujungnya ya, how how do you carry yourself? Eh, gimana cara bawa diri? Mm-hmm. It's very very mm-hmm. important in any industry. Very yes. very important, and and cara tell a story is very important. And I think I think for all the audience, like I think that's something to to practice to learn. And it, this is something that yang, yang bisa dipelajari juga gitu sama kayak AI, AI, AI ML. Yeah. Uh, Number two, I think what's interesting is the willingness to learn. Karena, mm-hmm. like you said, and it's very true, yeah, in in every industry, kayak mm-hmm. tiap lima tahun, empat tahun nanti berubah lagi semuanya. Yes. And, then, and then you yeah. gotta be really fast when when mm-hmm. and and not many people are are aware, and you have to be ready with that. Karena yeah. if you think about it, yeah, maybe I'm guilty for that. Yeah, abis an, waktu masih S satu aja kan, abis ujian final udah lupa gitu formulanya semuanya. So mm-hmm. unfortunately, it's it's hunting, like bener-bener kayak yeah. you're pushed to to actually yeah. do this. In, yeah. in this environment yeah. right now in the world yeah. Uh, so yeah and uh, I think thank you thank you so much for that Wina uh, and I think uh, for for the uh, audience and listeners I think we're, we'll, we'll start uh, uh, having some uh, live questions actually getting queued so I think uh, this will be the order uh, for those of you I, I think uh, some of you have already moved to the uh, to the question uh, mode right now I think I think we have Koirul from uh, Pepe Dunia and then uh, next up will be Tejas Wijonarko a student from NYU and then uh, there will be Ricky Susetio who's um who's a recent graduate from University of Toronto, uh, MBA Rodman. So I think uh, maybe we'll, we'll, we'll open the floor first to uh, Koirul Anam from PPA. And, and also thank you juga for the support, your uh, PPA Dunia support for this event. Uh, please go ahead, Mas Koirul. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Arki, for this great opportunity. This is an honor for me. I'm Koirul Anam. Uh, I'm now a coordinator of uh, PPA Dunia. And uh, yeah, I, I listen many things from all of you. Uh, RK said that uh, one day we must uh, return to Indonesia, to develop Indonesia, and that is an interesting idea, uh, and I agree with it. Uh, I have uh, the opinion that uh, all the professionals must return to Indonesia to develop uh, our country. Uh, okay, but I have uh, some question, and I apologize if my question is a little bit personal to all of you, uh, very great speakers. Uh, uh, I see many potential and professional uh, Indonesian currently working abroad and devoting themselves to inter- international companies, example like Mona at Microsoft, uh, Chipta at Google Play, and uh, Cartoon at uh, CVP. And for all of you, do you think it Uh, it will be better to continue working abroad or return to Indonesia. Uh, and uh, what are the obstacles that prevent you from returning to Indonesia immediately to help Indonesia? Thank you very much. Um, Arki, how Go are ahead. we going to do this? Oh, uh, <laughs> I think... Um, <laughs> Maybe uh, if if there's any specific person, uh, Anam, uh, but if not, then I probably I, we know you, you wanna. I, I think for all the speakers. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so I think I think we can do quickly. Like uh, maybe we can start with Wina first. Uh, Wina, what's your what's your what's your take on this? Um, that is a very good questions. Um, there's nothing prohibiting at the well. It, it, this is an actual that I actually think of all the time uh, returning to Indonesia definitely uh, that is has that's been always in the back of my mind uh, but at uh, at the moment uh, really my focus is in developing myself for getting that more exposure uh, what is it that the company in global really needs and how do I translate that to Indonesian culture and working in Indonesian culture because I did have experience a little bit over a year working in Indonesia before I came here to the US and definitely the it's a very different culture in terms of um, the management style how you work in in order and the advancement so at the moment as of today i feel like the knowledge that i have and the contribution i can contribute more here and gain more experience and learning here and then once it's all solid and nice and that is something very concrete that i can bring to indonesia definitely contribute to indonesia definitely that's going to be uh, something uh, that i will do and the good thing about today is you don't really have to be present in that place 
to contribute, right? So you can actually do it virtually. You have like what GPA is doing right now is actually that we're all here abroad, but we're really trying to develop human capitals in Indonesia by sharing stories. Uh, so that is that is for me. So right now, we're with there are, in terms of cost, the benefit we're gaining more right now today nine and a half year in the industry is not enough to say yes I'm an expert uh, so there are more to come with, to get that executive presence and then um, contributing back to Indonesia so hopefully that answers yeah. your question good good so uh, hey boleh nambah sesuatu go ahead Cipta. yeah so uh, thank you master what the question is also something yang yang aku juga of always thinking about that um, of course like uh, my parents are also in indonesia so it's like uh, it's it's still it's still in the back of my mind I would say. but i think i think same with uh, it's a, a question for me if if the me that comes to indonesia today uh, is or or the me that comes to indonesia in five years like which one would have more impact gitu. i'm still well Every th- every time I think like okay I've learned everything and then the next day I go to work there's always something that's like oh wow that's that's something I didn't know kayak nggak nggak sadar perlu itu dan kayak perasaan kalau pindah ke Indonesia itu this kind of skill misalnya tadi yang Arki bilang interpersonal skills leadership th- these are all like uh, menurutku in Indonesia is is not just like useful but even more necessary gitu dan dan juga tadi yang Pak uh, Pak Bambang bilang itu so, uh, soal AI infrastructure and like the the groundwork that the, uh, there's a lot of good people are doing back in Indonesia. I'm sure it's also like making that question harder and harder to answer every uh, every passing day. So uh, so that's kind of like just that's what I wanted to add. Interesting, interesting. Um, Mona, you have any comments uh, on sure. your side? Sure. Uh... So I think this is this is a this is a, this is a super interesting question. Um, uh, we've been we've been thinking about it for like years now uh, about uh, the idea of coming back to Indonesia. Um, however, um, ini sebenarnya pertanyaan sama aja kayak um, pertanyaan ke orang Jakarta, orang yang merantau dari kampung terus ke Jakarta, terus tanyain kenapa kamu tidak balik ke kampung gitu. It is it is a very hard question um, and it is a very personal question. It it, it applies to like um, everywhere, not only if you're abroad but if we are merantau in general. Um, but I think uh, one thing that one thing that we decided, I mean me and my husband, we decided um, is we don't we don't want to go back to Indonesia as a quote unquote penalu. We don't want to go back to Indonesia without any plan at all. We don't want to go back to Indonesia just looking for a job, starting from zero and doing nothing. I mean, not doing nothing, but like give zero impact whatsoever. So we want to make sure that once we go back to Indonesia, we we have built the bridge. Uh, we have built the connection, the bridge, and then um, we we want to make sure that once we go back to Indonesia, we can we can give more impact, just as Chipta mentioned before. So not not become a banalo or something like that so that's yeah that's for me i i think definitely thanks uh, for all the insights chipta wina and and Vita. i think one thing to add yeah and and this is based on our observation uh, both at the uh, working professional hub and 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 also uh, from the gipa uh, perspective like from around the world too so sebenarnya Indonesian professional overseas too in the back of their mind kalau ditanya mau pulang ke Indonesia enggak jawabnya pasti mau uh, but mm-hmm. but the, the only one there's only there's one thing though yang very very interesting karena overseas too there's a lot of knowledge and innovation center mm-hmm. uh, you gain so much of that and and I think uh, that is something yang biasanya nahan orang untuk belum mau pulang dulu gitu ya uh, mm-hmm. and number two, uh, if you ask maybe 90% of everybody professional luar tuh if you want to contribute to Indonesia the answer is yes and this is an example basically like mm-hmm. like we want to share what we know and and we'd be happy to take questions and and answer gitu Mm-hmm. So, so I think I think that's a uh, uh, at least like we we know there's a huge positive community uh, around the world, and we really really want to share our knowledge back home, and and hopefully like through the, one this is one of the channel, but mm-hmm. we we would definitely use any channel to be able to do so, and I I can guarantee you like every every one of us is somewhat in pasti ada satu orang setiap orang pasti ada project lalu tu Indonesia deh in yang di luar negeri or like doing something yeah. so yeah so i think uh, hopefully that answers your question madam and i think uh, i'd like to invite uh, tejas if you're ready to to ask your question all right uh, thanks 
Yeah, uh, so so do a quick introduction. Uh, nice hat, by the way. Uh, so Thank you. Do, do a quick introduction and then, uh, yeah, feel free to shoot your question. All right. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Tejas. Uh, I'm an undergrad at NYU and uh, it's my final year now. Um, and yeah, I, I'm a person interested in working in tech. I've done a lot of product management work uh, in the past and I also do a lot of UX, uh, UX projects, right? Um, and one of my questions I think comes to... Um, in the, in the minds of a lot of people nowadays because you know the job market isn't so hot right now and the the markets are super volatile too right and you know one of the big questions that i guess i have for the entire squad really is you know with ai and ml you see a lot of automation and a lot of processes and a lot of roles right and then what you know is in a lot of job layoffs right a lot of the critical roles that are related to um Easy, maybe maybe more uh, roles that could be like streamlined or automated. Those those roles are gone, and even people say like accounting. Accounting has been automated by a lot of processes too, right? So my question is, what jobs or roles in finance and tech will go out of style or become irrelevant due to the advancement of AI and ML, right? And yeah, it's for everybody, I guess the question. Yeah. So I think uh, thanks <laughs> thanks Tejas for for asking the question. Maybe maybe I'll direct this to Wina, uh, who is working mm -hmm. in both like intersection mm -hmm. of. I mean I mean Chipta definitely is, but uh, mm -hmm. I think I think uh, Wina, if you don't mind taking Tejas's question. Yeah, yeah. What yeah, what the Tejas say, said is really true. Uh, the what's been going on uh, up until today, it's the job that is actually moving away is all the and then repetitive um, that doesn't really add value that definitely goes away with the how robotics we actually did this for one of the financial reporting um, uh, back a few years ago where it's it's really like that you know running macro refresh and then spits mm. out the report and then send so that new and repetitive pattern actually goes away but not necessarily the job itself so the person whoever did the run macro and then look at the report making sure the report is generated actually can add more value by looking into the details looking at the report you see oh okay today uh, how's our daily pnl how's our var how's our risk exposure for today doing more in-depth analysis uh, so we're actually what robotics is doing is actually you're you're giving more time for someone who only have in a day like an hour for this report you're giving that extra time to look into the details is there something that you're missing that all this time you haven't really looked into because you're busy running those macro and refreshing those report uh, so in my point of view and then looking into the industry is not really a job itself but more, a part of your job is being automated and therefore you can contribute more in from based on your skills, whether it's in accounting or as a risk analysis, to make a decision to tell senior management or your manager, hey, by the way, I noticed uh, the, there's a change here. Is this something that we should bring up? Uh, talk to the to talk to the business. Is this something they have to change position or something something like that? So adding more value for a human, because that in the end, that's what you should be. That's you're adding more value like that. Is that's it's more. Um, you have more like hidupnya jadi lebih meaningful when you when you do that kind of uh, work, right? Instead of like being a robot so if it's if you think that the job right now you're doing is a robot then probably likely a robot should be taking that and then start thinking that okay what is it at another at value that human can do but not ro robot can do mm -hmm, so. mm -hmm. thank you yeah thank you thank you Mina. i think i think that's very uh, uh good question Tejas, and yeah. Mina, thanks for answering uh so i think uh i uh, before before i jump to uh, uh uh, Ricky, actually, I, I we do. I, I want to take uh, some questions as well that has been posted uh, into into the chat and also from our YouTube channel. So I think uh, there's a question here uh, from uh, uh, from Fahmi. Uh, the question I'll, I'll just read out. Yeah, uh, hi guys. Uh, have you watched the movie Social Dilemma uh, mm -hmm. and the issue regarding of overuse personal data using AI ML? Uh, what's the opinion? And I think I think it's a timely question juga ya, karena banyak yeah. regulation, peraturan pemerintah yeah. keluar, um, and also a lot of issues with regards mm -hmm. to the usage of AI and personal data. Gitu. Probably mm -hmm. if if um, somebody uh, maybe I would I would. Uh, consider uh, Mona. Maybe you'd be suitable to answer this, considering you're in you're in uh, cybersecurity. Like, what's your take on this? 
Sure. Um, so I remember, uh, before, I think before I went to grad school, um, I read a book called um, The Weapon of Math Destruction. So it is like the quote-unquote social dilemma before, <laughs> before um, I mean, in the book form. So it, it, it explains a lot, like how math or artificial intelligence, uh, ML can help people, but also it has a lot of drawbacks. If, for example, if we have a lot of bias in the data, if we, if we don't, if, if we don't have like, I mean, if, if the intention is not right, for example, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there, there's a lot of, there's a lot of way, um, and, and in the tech world, um, it is neutral until the one who use it um, have like unneutral intention, stuff like that. It's like knife. It has um, the, the double edges. Um, however, uh, what, what we can do right now is to prevent, um, we can do that by preventing, um, preventing that to happen uh, from, from many sides. For example, um, in my office right now, in my, in my company, we have a lot of um, regulation regarding data, how to store data, how long we can store data. We can only uh, permit it to start data to start data in a certain in a certain in a certain time, and we can we we only permit it to train the data um, in the data that is necessary. So we don't so we don't do personal data. So we don't store any anything like that to prevent that. Um, so yes, um, it is it is sadly the truth of the technology. Um, it, you you'll if if I mean if. If the intention is wrong, the result can be wrong, but we can prevent that by um, by doing a lot of things. For example, um, doing regulation. Uh, that's why we have GDPR in the Europe, for example. I think I would like to add a little bit to that, uh, Archie. Yep. So yeah, so in it all goes to the data. That that's true, but it, it's for taking the social dilemma. Uh, document uh, social dilemma examples you as a user have uh, a say I have a say on that so the more you feed like your clicks that will feed to the data that will feed and then and then the machine learning will say oh this person this user is actually is feeding what I'm what I'm serving to you so the more you so you know when you look into that uh, either in facebook you have that recommendation of videos or recommendation of, um or icon you know the more you click then the more it feeds to the data so my recommendation if you do see that don't or even in news uh you, they because this is the dangerous part is when news you you keep on feeding from the that recommendation then it will just it will just uh emphasize what what you thought that is true Meanwhile, it probably not. So, as a user, you need to be critical. Also, whether what does this new is this news that I'm reading right now does it make sense? You could find another independent source and search it yourself. Actually, go to that tab, click it yourself instead of feeding off of the recommendation. So, in the end, yeah, what Mona it was really true that government regulation is is important to in and especially in the future and like uh, that your privacy that is important. But as a user yourself, you have the you have a contribution also here where uh, when you don't click on the especially if you're uh, if you're you're concerned with that privacy or data bias or like. The racism, don't feed off of that. So that click share, that's even though it's innocent, just click, but that's actually a data for them. So you're feeding the data. So, yeah. Yeah, Thank you. Like sharing or something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> like, share. Uh, that's it's innocent, right? But the repercussion, what you, at the back, where does that go? It goes to the data. Yeah. Uh, uh, something? Go ahead, Cipta, and then uh, we'll we'll immediately um, uh, conscious of time. Jadi, uh, if you sure. can okay. tangkapannya very quick aja. Yeah, it, it is definitely like a complex question because just then sometimes on the business side, it's okay, it's hard to okay, it's hard to drill down and try to think think through all these interactions that will happen when these things feed back on each other. Gitu. And then it's something kayak yang I think. Everywhere from academia to industry, everybody's trying to kind of like figure this out and try to control control it and make it make it safe for users to browse it. So yeah, definitely great question and very timely. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Shipta and 
uh, Mona and Wina, and I think thank you juga uh, Mas Fami who asked from the Restack Bin YouTube. Uh, I think uh, I what uh, what I'm going to do is that uh, let's bring in the uh, other speaker, Ricky. And I think uh, before I, I pass it on to Ricky, uh, just want to let you know that we do have a lot of questions on the on the on the panelists' uh, view. I think the speakers you can also see it, uh, and then we can methodologically go uh, and. Any what ngasih expectation aja for everybody. If your question is not answered in the session today, we will send it to you offline through email, and we've done this in the past juga. Gitu. Jadi don't worry, uh, we'll we'll get to all your questions uh, regardless bagaimanapun. Maybe Cipta can help develop an AI algorithm to answer ya Cipta ya. <laughs> so anyway, uh, okay, so let's uh, let's bring in uh, Ricky, Ricky from Toronto, Canada. Hi, uh, good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Ricky here from Toronto. Thanks, everyone, for their insight. It's been a really interesting session yeah, so far. So let's try to stay on this ethical side of AI for another question at the very least. I hope you guys don't mind this. So as you just mentioned, Mona and Wina, we all know, yeah, kalau AI too takes on the biases of the training data set it learns from. So the challenge here is that we all know there's also no such thing as a perfect data set. So even if we are aware of these biases, there will always be under or upper representation in any data sample that we are using when we train these uh, models for AI or uh, ML. So mm -hmm. it's a complex issue, yes, but mm -hmm. how do we overcome this? Like how, who should be in charge of, or take mm -hmm. charge of this? Like who should be responsible? The government through the regulations, the enterprise that develops the AI, the academia, or is it us as society? Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. So, anybody who's interested to answer this interesting question? And that's the million dollar question. Yeah, <laughs> it's a million dollar question, um, so <laughs> you should give I'll a billion try. dollar answer. Yeah, <laughs> I'll try to answer um, to the best of my knowledge. What I can try to sp scope it down to my work so uh because we work i my team uh, we built dashboards and those dashboards like there's a visualization and that vis visualization helps to make decisions right um what happens is when as a user you don't really see what's at the back of those data where the data lake the data store data warehouse you don't really see the structure and the population uh, but you do each of those data warehouse has an owner so you, as an owner, they have to testify to and to be transparent of what is it that goes to that data warehouse. And those uh, attest attestation has to be part of the disclosure in the dashboard. So when user looks into, uses this tool dashboard, uh, they can see, oh, okay, I'm, whatever the outcome of the, the algorithm, uh, the result, it is based on a data population of business A and B, for example. So they know that if I only have uh, 6% of data for business C, I know, and then there's somehow saying that the result, there's no correlation between business A and C. They know for, they can, they have to be skeptical uh, about the result. So disclosure data transparency is important whenever, it, especially to, it's important to disclose. Um, now let's bring that upward to the real world. You don't, you don't know, right? So what, what the how the data is it's even if you ask right now there is no regulation uh, saying that social media has to tell okay these are my population because um, there's no such thing right and then so who is responsible I think everyone who touches the data has the responsibility as a user you have to be critical in whatever outcome that you get from the result of the machine learning algorithm. As a government, you have to make see how this social, how the network, this machine learning algorithm talks to each other. And this is global. Like, take example, Facebook, Instagram, right? You, you, it, it all connects us so close, and then it really uh, scopes how we view things and and that's dangerous when when if that becomes an your opinion or how you your value right so so as a user you have to be critical going back to 
be always challenged. It's gonna, it's, it's uh, more work compared to maybe 15 years ago where your source of information is just Quran, gitu kan? uh, but now you have so many feeding news and then you have to be, you want to challenge whether this is really correct or not and have that open mind. Um, AI, I don't like, this is hard for me because I'm probably a bit biased in this. There's AI, AI is doing what they're supposed to do. So when you're running this algorithm and then it tends to be very specific to exactly what you want. It means the AI is doing what is, is, is job. And it's a good model. What Mona is Islam Mona and model ni So it's it's true. So and so I from AI perspective perspective, the algorithm is not at fault, but it's the control over uh, those uh, data is what needs to be needs to um, have the accountability. So yeah, the user, like the government, has a place. The industry also has to have a, uh, it has has to be held accountable to this. Uh, like, what do you do with the data? You can there is some like privacy uh, in there. There's privacy regulation, but beyond that, you do have to have the uh, the industry accountable on what you're doing with those data. Um, Thank you. That's, thank that's my take. Yeah. Thank you, Wina. And Enrique, yeah. thanks for asking a very, very interesting question. Definitely a million yeah. dollar question. And I think, uh, yeah. tambahan aja juga from, from what we're witnessing in the industry, I think uh, uh, government, uh, academia, etc., or, or as pa, Mama mentioned, triple, there's some sort of like a triple helix relationship juga gitu in the context of mm-hmm. regulating yeah. atau memberikan peraturan pemerintah to AI. I think some of the terms yang uh, maybe uh, for all the audience to, to also consider atau remember gitu, maybe this is not uh, something that we'll deep dive karena uh, it's going to be, it's going to take another hour if we talk about this. Tapi mm-hmm. no, ada namanya explainability, interpretability, uh, uh, the, the biasness. There's so many new concepts that's coming in lit- and benar-benar baru datang tuh sekitar kayak 12 18 bulan yang lalu gitu baru baru masuk ke mainstream in the adoption in the industry and, and i think in the next 1 to 5 years there's going to be a very very new, uh, interesting apa uh, materi pelajaran baru pasti untuk artificial intelligence yang yang menyangkut dengan uh, uh, your life uh, regulation dan lain-lain gitu so yeah, thank mm-hmm. you Wina. So uh, I think with that, uh, what what I want to spend time on right now is actually going into career progression, or or breaking into the the uh, AI ML uh, type of industry. So I think so many questions right now. Actually, I, I do I do see like uh, on the on the uh, chat. Uh, here right now in the panelist chat, uh, a lot of people are asking questions. Uh, gimana caranya pursue data science or AI career? Uh, what's what are the opportunities that's available? I think I'm, uh, we're we're very excited. Like so many people are so engaged in, in the call, and thanks everybody for for posting your questions. So I think I think what what will be interesting is that. Uh, breaking into, I know I did ask you uh, previously, like we get to breaking into this top company. Right? Tapi let's let's go more a uh, little bit more gitu on on the uh, 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 maybe combining the, this the set of technical aspects. I think I think Mona, you have an interesting story about about your 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 trajectory into Microsoft. Gitu. Maybe hmm. can you elaborate a little bit on that? I think it'll help uh, uh, the audience and also listeners to to know. Uh, apa sih yang kayak, what, what's the unique element of this job application that you've experienced? Sure. Um, disclaimer: um, Looking for a job is hard. It is. It is very, very hard. So you have to be patient at first. That's that's first disclaimer. And second disclaimer, or not, not second disclaimer, but the second thing, um, in the in the marketing, um, uh, there's a saying called um, blue ocean strategy and red ocean strategy. So the blue ocean strategy is a strategy where um, you specify something. Um, it is a market that is untouched, undeveloped yet. So there are a lot of things that can be explored. And the red red ocean strategy um, is for the competitive market, um, <clears throat> for the very competitive market where it is, there are a lot of competition there. It is, it is very hard to go into. Um, so I, so at first, um, I did the blue, quote unquote, blue ocean first. Um, so I, I graduated from, from grad school. I have urban informatics degree and I, I was, I was, um, I was having imposter syndrome back then. I, I didn't have confidence. I know I am quote unquote smart, not smart, but like I, I, I'm on par with my, my, with my friends, but I just didn't have the, um, the confidence to then, go to the, to the big company so i so i approached the small quote unquote small company first um so i did my blue ocean strategy uh, 
I know that this company is a civil engineering company. They need um, data science. Um, they they have urban planning section. They have interesting um, project, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I tailored um, my resume, and I network with the people. So they have a job fair, and um, in my in my school back then, I approached them, have a conversation with them, and surprisingly, I got a job uh, because. Um, I am very niche and they're looking for me at that time. Uh, and um, in that company, I built my confidence. Um, I met with uh, my mentor, my boss, that gave me a lot of um, responsibility to stuff. Um, and finally, I have my confidence. I can talk to people. Um, I can uh, talk with my client. I can consult to my client, stuff like that. And uh, finally, I am going to the Red Ocean Market. Um, I, I was curious to try to go into the, the more, uh, the bigger companies. So I tried to apply for all the big companies. Um, I applied for a uh, hundred jobs at the time. I, rem I remember um, I submit my resume to, I don't know, a hundred to hundreds. And then I got then. 10 phone interviews, I believe. And then I got four on-site interviews. And um, finally, I got uh, one, two offers, and I accept one of them, which is Microsoft. So um, from my story, you can, you can see that it is, it is very hard. It is very hard to go there. And I did have a, a, stepping, to, a stepping stone, and my stepping stone was to, to work in that smaller company first to build my confidence. Uh, but then uh, you don't actually you don't have to worry if, you're, um, if, you, if you want to work uh, overseas, if you are just starting, and if you just grad, graduate from the overseas school, uh, all that big companies usually have that diversity program um, and it is actually a privilege for us. Um, they are looking for a more diverse people, um, which, which is great because, because they're looking for people like us, actually. Uh, but again, um, as um, it is, I mean, in, in all the races, I mean, um, dalam sebuah lomba, kalau misalkan kita ikut lomba lari, privilege is like sepatu roda. But like if you if you don't um, if you don't apply for for the comp for for the for the race at the first place we we won't we won't go to the finish line, um, and we if we don't know how to use this patoroda and then we'll, we'll just fall again. Uh, use your privilege wisely, and um, it is hard. So be patient. Thank you, uh, Mona. I think that's a very very interesting story i'm just curious like uh, is it because red ocean you're wearing a red headset you guys sekarang <laughs> or <laughs> so anyway um i think i think to recap yeah uh, jadi blue ocean tuh basically uh, you're applying for jobs yang uh, basically it's not like competing globally ya yeah. competingnya lebih ke narrow lebih mm -hmm. lebih niche lebih ke targeted kan you did urban informatics so when you apply mm -hmm. you focus in that area jadi kayak the number of competitionnya lebih dikit uh, yep. tapi at the same time lebih fokus and and usually the company emang kayak nyari orang dari background tersebut and and i think right. from what you're saying this is a good stepping stone and and i think i think for everybody in the call like uh, i think all of us here in the call uh, including uh, we nachi plus semuanya ada stepping stone gitu it's not it's not like kita tiba-tiba langsung masuk to the global company like out of nowhere gitu yeah i mean some people can do that they're usually like the prodigy or the genius gitu but but usually all of us go from like a stepping stone method like smaller company or less mm -hmm. less known company then baru jump in gitu uh, and I think the red ocean strategy is when when you you con you're confident that okay I'm I'm I think I'm good uh, on par with the industry or or above average and and then when you're when you're when you're uh, ready for that then you jump in into the red ocean strategy. So I, I think I think it's it's very very interesting uh, and I think I would like for everybody juga try to remember uh, this this method uh, when you're considering your job application and and the last part is diversity yeah. I think it's interesting not many people actually know uh, kerja the US, the Canada, overseas tuh ternyata kantor tuh super diverse banget gitu. And, and you, that actually that actually gives advantage to you, uh, dapat ben, extra benefit. Karena uh, I think right now, a lot of corporate governance, mereka emang nge-push supaya you have more diverse talent candidate. And and uh, this actually helps karena they, they want to uh, create like a very, uh, apa, yang, yang beragam in terms of your employee. So so think about that. And, and a lot of multinational companies are going in this direction.
gitu. Uh, thank you Mona for your insights. Um, I think anybody else want to add in gitu in in the context of like uh, a, a job application uh, and and what what do you think is relevant? Uh, maybe if I can uh, bring in Cipta now, like Cipta, what what's your take? Kalau misalnya <laughs> if you're looking for a candidate, let's mm-hmm. say any uh, people in the call are very interested to 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 go for uh, mm-hmm. the the Google or or something similar gitu. Okay, what do you what do you yeah. recommend? Well, kalau misalnya di role cool, well, my team, gitu, what we are looking for are people that can take on both sides of kayak, uh, kayak breaking down the problem, kayak ini ada, ada objektif ini, terus how, how do we turn that into like a problem that can you, that can we can use ML or data science on. Terus, and then once we establish that, kayak bring that to reality gitu in Google scale. Jadi ya, kita perlu orang yang punya both technical skills but also very nice people skills gitu yang bisa know about like the business end of of, of uh, the the product as well. Jadi mereka bisa anticipate um, future requirements, bisa kayak think in a bigger picture, bisa bisa go 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 beyond gitu the, to the beyond the uh, Beyond just making the ML model itself, so okay, uh, <coughs> the ML model building itself. Once you is 90% or 95%, it's like doing all this other stuff and getting your the organization to move in that direction to okay, uh, to be smarter about ML and stuff. Get. Thank you, thank you, Chipta. And and it's really true. Uh, any problem solving itu enggak narrow. It's like everything ya ada ada manajemennya ada ada uh, industry expertise industry insights and enggak bisa kayak enggak langsung enggak langsung kayak yeah problem A and solve problem A ternyata enggak you have to problem you have to solve for A to Z and mm-hmm. i think uh, one thing yang uh, many people don't realize and and that's why uh, in the beginning i mentioned like the the character uh, your leadership in the context of professional development too you have to work with so many people and when you're working with so many people you you really have to know how to communicate well as as Wina mentioned then juga kayak you, you have to have a certain level of expect standard gitu gimana caranya uh, untuk manage this uh, large projects so uh, i think i think uh, another area that i want to explore and, and definitely i like to hear uh, inputs from the speaker so let's let's break into the myth of uh, ai artificial intelligence and machine learning yeah So when we think about AI, ML tuh yang keren-keren biasanya muncul tuh yang kayak, uh, algoritm bisa prediksi kalau orang ini ternyata kena penyakit X atau bisa bikin uh, bisa bikin trajectory buat roket ke bulan dan lain-lain gitu. But in reality, like if if we break it down ya, modelingnya berapa persen when you actually build the output sama data prepnya berapa persen? What's what's the breakdown? <laughs> so Wina, maybe if you can yeah. you can share on this. Yeah, I touched this a little bit in the beginning of data, the data quality. So yeah, like <clears throat> like a lot of my time is really data quality cleaning. So you we we onboarded data scientists because we are only focused on the end result, which is we how do we get how do we make sure we're automating all this regulatory report, uh, the dashboard, etc. But then we okay, let's go on with it. Let's make that algorithm, and then apparently the result is not as expected. And then when you trace, it's really the data you have really bad bad data. The, the data is sloppy, and you ended up okay. Let's clean <laughs> let's clean the data first before we actually move on to the modeling side or creating the uh, the 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 predictions, um, etc. So I think that is mostly the case in big companies where it's already been established for quite a long time because they didn't really have data culture before the data culture is only existing for probably last like eight not eight nine years ago and as time goes by then there are more starting companies start to invest in the data the how the application and then the data storage using more clouds more and then uh, the and then they're and then cleaning the data and with that you also with the cleaning the data is not just necessarily okay let's get rid of this abc no it's it's actually much more complex than that it's like you have the 100,000 books and you want to put it in the library and there's no organizing method and one day someone regulators come in okay i want book a okay give me some time which is like a very long time to get find that book a because there's just no 
organization towards that. So if we're taking out, stripping out everything, put, taking out the sample or every, uh, the data masking and then dump it, look where is the ones that is duplicating and where's the one that is make, that makes sense on the correlation of data. Uh, so that's really uh, what we're doing today uh, we're still using data scientists, we're still using machine learning, but uh, in terms of the percentage, we're doing mostly that now compared to the really great stuff, the, um, the modeling aspect. Uh, but to that note, it doesn't mean that this is going to be happening for the rest of our lives, no, because now it's like maybe our generation is focused on data quality and then as the company is more investing more, your data is going to be much cleaner when there's like a merger and acquisition into a business then one of the component in that uh, agreement is also the data so that will help a lot because once data comes in it's junk it's, it's harder to get rid of you know because it's already there and people already start using it it's harder to trace back saying oh you know what this is not right so it's easier to be the first front before the data actually gets in to your data warehouse or your data leak instead of it's already in there and then cleaning it up. Thank you, Ina. Very, very uh, insightful. Um, from Chipta and Mona, what's, what's your take on this? How much time you spend on data prep compared to modeling? Oh, I already said it's like 95. <laughs> 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 and that's, that's generous. Um, kalau dari sisi ku, uh, pas in my team, the, usually like, yes, the modeling tools are already in place, but sometimes the data is like all over the place. Jadi dari Sabang sampai Merauke, tim ini punya kolom tiga dari seratus kolom yang kita mau. Tim Sono punya lima dari seratus kolom. Nobody kayak yang, nggak ada tim yang bener-bener take all these together and produce one data set that you feed to the model. That's what a lot of the complexity is from our team to do that. And then when you try doing that, kayak, bakal ada banyak follow up questions yang you have to answer gitu. Jadi misalnya kayak how long can you store this data? Kayak, do you respect user privacy when you when you join all these things? Like how do you make sure kayak yang tadi um, yang tadi Ricky bilang soal kayak fairness gitu kayak are, kayak jangan sampai ada golongan-golongan yang enggak sengaja kita exclude karena kita we didn't take care of that gitu. Terus kayak jadi a lot of these questions yang we have to answer dan we have to define and justify ourselves in front of kayak, uh, uh, in our internal kayak team yang nge audit semuanya, misalnya kayak privacy, security, uh, uh, and like, and, and yeah, privacy, security, legal, and stuff. And then, baru, after you did all that, which could take weeks, could take months, then you spend like a week modeling. And that's like the, the happiest day, uh, the happiest <laughs> week in the quarter. <laughs> Piece until you realize you need more data, right? Uh, <laughs> then you go back. <laughs> then you start the process again. So, to. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chipta. Uh, uh, thank you, Wina. I think uh, another uh, one thing that I want to ask. Ini, ini banyak nih pertanyaan nih dari 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 uh, panel question nih. Do you actually need to have uh, uh, ML or AI background to enter this field as a as an as a formal degree, you know? or this is something that you can learn uh, on yourself? Um, I think maybe I, I'd like to invite Mona. Um, you actually did urban study, right, or urban informatics, but now you're you're okay. you you have actually uh, apa, uh, transcend into a, a different area yang lebih sophisticated, gitu. You know? So mm -hmm. what's your take? Uh, maybe if you can also uh, respond quickly, you get conscious of time. Sure. Yeah. Um, jadi gini, um, all my friends uh, when I was in grad school, they're not, like most of them are not from the IT or computer science. Most of them are from um, the other subjects, uh, actually like political science, um, management, anything like that. So I, I believe that, yes, you can be a data scientist um, if, if you have other backgrounds. Um, you just need to understand how that works. You just need to understand um, how that works, how to apply things, how to collect data and all that stuff. But yes, you can do that with various backgrounds. And actually it benefits you um, because because the, the most important thing in the data science is the applicability. Is it applicable in the business? And if you have the background of the business, uh, for example, uh, in my case, I, I 
urban urban science, for example, and it it was a really really beneficial for me because I can then just just apply it. I don't have to like talk to somebody else. Um, but because now in this case I don't have background in cybersecurity, I have to then talk with the um, researcher with with the experts to come up with my model. And and I think uh, Wina, did you have an ML background or or artificial intelligence background? I don't. Uh, so yeah. my undergrad is actually math, and then my uh, graduate background is actually economics. So what Mona said is really true. It goes back to are you willing to learn or not? And mm -hmm. uh, with any kind of exposure that you get, oh, AI is interesting, data management is interesting, and you just jump into it and learn. And like other courses, if you're like the um, like Coursera, Udemy, they have those. Um, in those courses, right? So it can actually show in your resume you've been doing all those. That just shows that you're willing to learn. Yeah. Thank you, Wina. Jadi yeah. basically the the nasha yolo aja gitu ya, kayak langsung mm -hmm. just hajar aja gitu if you want to yeah. learn it. Yeah. Um, but but something important juga uh, to to add in for everybody in the call. Uh, I think it's always nice. Misalnya, uh, I I think uh, connect with somebody uh, yang mm -hmm. yang emang expert in this thing. Karena kan, if you want to learn, I mean, kalau misalnya secara kasar gitu, you want to learn how to cook ya, masa nanti you you just don't go to the kitchen and cook, right? You have to ask your mm -hmm. mom or you have to ask your uh, uh, somebody yang ngerti cara masak. Gitu. Jadi just to give yeah. you a guidance gitu. Maybe you can read the instructions. Pretty really simple, but it's always nice to have somebody yang kayak expert gitu. And and I think that's part of the thing that we're trying to do. Juga. Juga as, as as part of this uh, GIPA initiative and also uh, connecting it with the, the various IPA and GIPA group. Itu. We want to connect all the professionals. Maybe we can share this in a, in a more uh, a formal and systematic manner to everybody. And and I think uh, just keep that in mind. Like you just uh, build your connection and build your network. Uh, uh, I think it's it will really help when it comes to learning something that's very new to you. You know. um, okay, so I think uh, I think we have like about uh, six minutes left. Uh, I think we can probably uh, ask a, uh, answer a couple of more questions uh, from the panelists. Ini ada like really a lot of questions, and I think hopefully we've answered some by by uh, what what I'm trying to do is actually combining some of the questions together, and and hopefully this answers your questions for the ones who are listening. Uh, but I think uh, probably one thing that's interesting we did mention about stepping stone, and and kenapa pentingnya itu uh, going from stepping stone lang gak langsung ke to this area or this field gitu. Maybe kalau bisa quickly aja ya, very very quickly uh, to to the speakers gitu. Like where did you start first uh, in in terms of work gitu? Uh, maybe I can start with Chipta gitu before Google. Where where did you work and uh, again and, and and how did the stepping stone help uh, for you to to go into Google? Sure. My I started with Taxet Research, so it's kind of like. Uh, if people know Bloomberg, like financial data and stuff like that, it's one of their competitors. Then I then I joined Google not as an ML engineer, but as a front end engineer. So so big career change there. But I thought like it's Google, like I'll take any job they they give me, and then I'll just you know just go in. You know. <laughs> and it takes me five six years to what some back of my my current team right now. Yang actually what I wanted to go in to in the first place tapi baru kayak sampai sekarang gitu loh baru kayak bisa tercapai. Jadi it it just takes uh, patience and sometimes it you might need to take a little detour here and there try to always keep moving closer and closer and you know, eventually you mm -hmm. do that gitu. Yeah, I think I think that's very very important. It's not like dari A ke B ya langsung. Mm -hmm. It's 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 like A B C and then baru nyampe Z is probably the final destination but jadi I think for for all like that's that's the expectation and i think uh, mona mentioned she applied for hundreds of jobs and i think that's true to many of of the speakers too uh, probably wina and chipta you've probably applied more than 50 jobs i believe in 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 the beginning right it's it's a normal process and we have to all go through this uh, uh process to to learn it it's not easy cuman uh, we we want to be able to share what's relevant. We want to be able to share apa sih yang kayak stepnya supaya supaya at least you're you're not doing this alone. Like we we are here to also provide you with some inputs. So now uh, I think maybe I I do want to uh, uh, take this uh, question. I think what's interesting. Uh, I I'm not sure uh, if if uh, some of you may be able to answer this. Cuman, uh, this is related to AI ML and the current pandemic right now. Uh, if 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 not, we can take it offline. You guys, call misalnya anybody from uh, one of the speakers here. Young, young, have have you seen any any usage of AI ML in the context of pandemic, like you're witnessing in the industry right now? 
more impacting on the regulatory front mm. where you now it's suddenly there's a new regulatory where okay how is this how is your model going to work with the COVID so uh, that like uh, it just sprung, it was just sprung to us that okay what do you do with the COVID scenario and then um, and then then you have to adapt the algorithm right so that's that's how that's how it impacted us uh, from yep. the workspace yeah. That makes sense, especially in the banking system. Yeah, the, the government mm -hmm. is very, very strict when it comes to perubahan economic environment. Yeah. Then yes. how does that impact Macro, your AI yeah. ML model? And mm -hmm. mereka ada certain expectation kan, sampai, uh, the, the accuracy nya boleh sampai uh, right. below the certain threshold gitu. Right, exactly. Yeah. One thing that happens like close to here in Singapore, mm -hmm. not really related to Google, but it's like they have started this whole the uh, massive contact tracing program, right? So pergi ke restoran mesti check in via, via QR code or tap in gitu and then tap out at the same time. So it is that's like uh, multiply that by like how, however many million Singapore citizens. That's a lot of data that come, that's coming into their system. And that would be like very interesting for like epidemiology research, a lot of a lot of that stuff. That that's going to be very interesting to follow in the future. Uh, it is a uh, privacy kind of forms, but uh, but that's like Part of the, mm -hmm. I guess, like the the trade-offs that we have to that we have to do as a society. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Chip. I think yeah, that's that's another like which you say is going to open another can of worms. Uh, I think they apply this also in in Korea. I think where um, uh, they they monitor where people are connected to one another, ketemu siapa aja, masuk ke mana aja, and I think uh, I, I guess that's one of the new use cases that we're seeing specific to the pandemic. And I I think also from from what we're witnessing in the industry, a lot of companies are using AI to predict COVID rates uh, growth uh, uh, over mm -hmm. time. Jadi, this is something that's pretty common juga gitu. So I think uh, we we are we are at the top of the uh, panel discussion and Q and A. Uh, I hope for everybody in the call, this is something uh, meaningful and useful for you to learn. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Wina, uh, Mona, and also Chipta for for sharing your insight. I think very very detailed, and we we went uh, into a very deep dive session. Yeah, for the questions that hasn't been answered, as I mentioned before, we will uh, take this offline and. We'll, we'll work together with, with the panelists untuk ngejawab, and then we'll share this to you offline. Uh, jadi, at least, we, we like I said, we'll cover everything uh, for you. Now, uh, to that end, uh, I would like to pass it back to our MC today, uh, uh, Mas Hilmi. Uh, so, Mas Hilmi, uh, back to you. Thank you, RK. So, great session. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for your participation. Without further delay, I'll be playing the prepared remarks from Indonesia's ambassador to the United States. His Excellency Muhammad Lutfi. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good evening to those of you following this from Indonesia. Good afternoon to those of you following this from Europe. And good morning to those of you who are in the United States. And greetings to everyone across the world who I didn't mention the time zone. Uh, on behalf of Indonesian Embassy in Washington, D.C., I would like to congratulate uh, the Global Indonesian Professional Associations for this important talks and important meeting. I saw Papa Mang Brojo supposed to address you uh, for the opening remarks, and I'm taking the privilege of addressing you as a closing remarks. I would like to apologize because I have to record this uh, message as I'm traveling uh, from the west coast of the United States back to Washington, D.C. Um, like the country, I'm also I'm also in a run since the 14th of September. I never stopped running until today because the country is also running. We have a lot of deadline. We have a lot of important things to do immediately in our future. A study by OECD shows that a country, a middle income country since 1969, cannot skip the middle income trap uh, when the demographic bonus is ended. So with that calculations, Indonesian demographic bonus, bonus should end between 2038 and 2040. This demographic bonus means that a lot more the young people and the elder generations. So 
basically we have to triple our gdp from around four thousand dollars today into triple by 2038 in order to skip this middle income trap uh, in order to skip from this middle income trap indonesia has to do two things basically one investing in infrastructure and second uh, is transfer of technology and innovations. So these two will propel us into tripling our GDP and skip the middle income trap. So we have to see also what is the pillars of our growth. And uh, from by Jokowi's speech during his campaign in 2019, we heard that he wants Indonesia to be number four economically in the world in 2045, which is 100 years after Indonesian independence. Uh, and then during his inauguration, uh, he says that Indonesia should be number five uh, economically in the world. Um, that means that Indonesian GDP uh, per capita will be around $23,000. Because I feel young, I just turned 51, I would like to see Indonesia to have a very aggressive and very good trajectory of growth. Um, so then we're going to talk about uh, Indonesia will be number four uh, in the world uh, during this time. So that means Indonesia have a, capa have a, have a GDP per capita around $29,000 with a trajectory of growth around 6.4%. And also because of that, Indonesia shall uh, escape or sell, shall graduate from the middle income by 2032. In order to reach that, Indonesia has to look at its component of its GDP. Today, our GDP uh, coming from capital formation or investment around 33% uh, today into 39% in order to reach that 6.4 GDP growth or GDP trajectory. So then, uh, from investment, the trajectory has to be around 7% in order to reach from 33% its contribution to GDP to 39% its contribution to GDP. In order to do that, Indonesia has to always reform its investment climate. We need to make sure that in, uh, Indonesian uh, cannot differentiate between domestic or international investment. We can't differentiate what country that we, we want to do business with. We basically have to be open because we understand that investment is the vitamin into our uh, GDP growth. And also, uh, because the investment climate needs to be better every year, we have a target as well. So between uh, 2025 to 2030, Indonesia has to be in the top 35 from number 73 today. And between 2035, 2040, we have to be in the top 20. And between 2040, 2045, we have to be in the top 10. So uh, the, 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 the omnibus law that had passed, I think it will enhance our investment climate and it will propel us hopefully by, by 2025 into number 35. Second part, um, and this is an important coefficient in our GDP, is uh, our international trade or in our GDP, this is a, a trade uh, export and import. Today, the contribution to the GDP is only 34% and making consumptions, actually the public consumptions is uh, uh, more than 50% of our GDP. So in the future, the balance between export and import has to dominate our GDP to 54%. Uh, it's a trajectory of 8% annually for international trade uh, or the, the balance between export and import. And because of that, Indonesia needs to open its market because this is a new norm in international trade that in order for us to sell more, we also have to buy more. Uh, and this is um, a study we, 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 we were given by, by Vietnam. Vietnam in 2015 uh, entered the agreement of Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement uh, because uh, uh, they, they, they are a member of the TPP. A lot of electronic companies invest in the country. Uh, opening the market means investment in the, in the country. Uh, Vietnam become 
the production base for electronics. Now, five years from uh, joining TPP, uh, Vietnam enjoys 105% export um, uh, into their GDP. So this is a good story. Means that in the new terms of international trade, people have to open the market, becomes a production center, and then exporting uh, that goods uh, as that uh, you know they produce as the production center of the country. So this is a new norm of international trade. That's why uh, uh, before when I was uh, uh, at the Ministry of Trade, Indonesia only had two uh, trade agreements, one with Japan, one is a preferential uh, trade agreement with Pakistan, which ended already last year, I think. And then uh, the rest are ASEAN scheme. Today, we are we signed already one with EFTA. This is um, uh, an association of four small countries in Europe. So we call, they call it a little Europe, Switzerland, Norway, Iceland, and Liechtenstein. Uh, we signed that already. We signed one with Australia and rectify it uh, by the uh, by the middle of this year. Uh, and before long, I think we're gonna we're gonna see more Toyota Innova in in Australia than any other country in the world. And this is a very good success story. The third one is industrializations. Industrializations right now, it's a GDP from manufacturing today, it's around 22%, and this has to grow to 30% of its GDP. In order to do that, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, let me correct that, to 26% of its GDP. In order to do that, Indonesia needs also to industrialize. So innovation and technology is a very important part of Indonesian development into uh, graduating from middle income track. So uh, this is something, a challenge that Indonesia needs to do. Sometimes it's very easy to say, but it is not. Because in order to have those, Indonesia needs also to develop its society, its job uh, market, uh, its job, uh, um, uh, its, its, its job or well, its workforce. Um, if you see today, uh, Indonesian uh, uh, high school diploma only amounted around 30% of its workforce. In 2045, this number has to change. 90% of Indonesian workforce has to graduate from high school. And then uh, today, only 30% from Indonesian uh, workforce uh, has a college degree. This has to turn to 60% in the future. And uh, right now, if you look at the, at the statistic, 25 million kids enter into first grade only uh, 15 million graduate from high school. 10 million basically disappear because we don't have the capacity. But this capacity is not because we cannot build school, but we need to have a good uh, qualified teacher in order to teach our kids. So with this COVID-19, ladies and gentlemen, suddenly we realize Indonesia needs to uh, revolutionize how to teach and taught Indonesian kids. You know, and uh, with this uh, platform of digital Indonesia, I think in the future can have a very good education system uh, based on technology, based on digital. And this is something we should embrace in the future. The second part is also healthcare. Healthcare needs to be addressed because uh, if you see, you know, we have 12,000 doctors, we produce around 12,000 doctors every year. but. For every, doc every uh, doctor that uh, graduate, uh, we that doctor needs to take care of about 400 babies. So this is one of the uh, um, one of the ratio that is not preferable for Indonesian people. And in the future, I would like to see if Indonesia can see the healthcare uh, can be uh, assisted by digital platform, digital technology as well. So this is part of homeworks that Indonesia have to do. And I'm expecting that the Indonesian professionals, Indonesian student associations across the world can find solutions for good technology in education, for a good technology in Indonesian healthcare system, because this too will proper Indone propel Indonesia into a good trajectory of growth. And hopefully that we can graduate as soon as possible from the middle income, because middle income trap is no fun. 
we saw countries, you know, across the world that fail the middle income trap and become a failed state. We saw Venezuela. Venezuela at one point produced around 4 million barrels a day of oil. And today, basically, they cannot get necessities on their table, on their household uh, enough because uh, they're toying around with leaderships that was basically uh, pro to the left and uh, not the pro to the market. Uh, and this is something that Indonesia needs to avoid uh, uh, as soon as possible and graduate into developed countries. We have a lot of challenge. You know, this COVID-19 as well uh, is not an easy task. Um, we in the entire universe never seen crisis like this. Merge of financial, uh, economic crisis, uh, supply chain crisis, demand side crisis, and merge into one crisis after the other that we have not seen the solutions yet. Um, and if you ask me when is the time to come back for to its original capacity, I don't know. Because if you look at the analogy or history, uh, Los Angeles International Airport was closed for two and a half days in 2001 after 9-11 happens in New York. Uh, it took Los Angeles International Airport 11 years to come back into the, the, the number that they serve uh, before they closed two and a half days in 2001. 11 years. This is a long time and this is something we are going to face also with this COVID-19. And hopefully with this you know, new technology, with new uh, platform of digital Indonesia, the world, every one of us can escape this uh, long leg uh, or long uh, uh, lead of, of uh, recovery from COVID-19. Uh, Indonesia have spent a lot of money uh, in order to make sure the social safety nets uh, are being assisted to all those needed in the country. Uh, we also fighting the COVID-19, all the numbers are not very encouraging, but uh, we are now basically waiting for vaccine to come. The world is waiting for vaccine to come and hopefully Indonesia will solve this as anyone in the world are trying to solve the issue as well. So, ladies and gentlemen, you know, uh, the challenge of Indonesia is big, but I'm pretty sure Indonesia was also uh, predicted not so good in 1998, and we proved to the world we can do it. And hopefully, you know, with a new talent, a new uh, generations, a better generations, a better equipped generations, Indonesia can escape the middle income trap. Indonesia can escape the COVID-19 uh, re recovery and Indonesia can graduate into uh, developed countries before 2038. This is a goal, series of goals that we have to do. Many of things uh, will be uh, needed in order to support this. So uh, one of the example is infrastructure. We need to develop good sustainable infrastructure so if it's about power plant uh, today our our sustainable uh, power plant or green power plant only counted less than five percent of indonesian generations for electricity in the future this has to grow to 25 percent in our energy mix this is needs a lot of technology this is needs a lot of innovations Indonesia will be able to do it with people, with professionals like you guys. So I pray to God that we can, you know, with this digital technology, we can um, uh, have a lot of discussions and I'll have a lot of solutions. And I'm expecting this young generations of Indonesians to be part of the solutions and not part of the problems. So I wish you well, and I hope these talks will follow by frequent talks uh, in the future to find solutions, to find angles, to find a way so Indonesia, Indonesia can skip the middle income trap, can graduate into developed countries. And for one thing, we have to survive this COVID-19. Please stay healthy. Uh, make sure that you're, uh, uh, you know, your your social distancing, wear your mask, because Indonesia needs you. Thank you very much. Have a good conference. 
not only today, but also in the future. I'm expecting that you will be part of the solutions of Indonesian challenge. I thank you. Wabili Taufiq wal Hidayah. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Thank you for the very visionary yet substantive and coherent remarks, Your Excellency. I'd also like to thank um, Bapak Iwan Freddy, Deputy Chief of Mission, Bapak Bima Dwipayudanto, Korfung Ekonomi, Bapak Yudo Sasongko, Korfung Wet and Sosburg, Mas Maulana Kasetra, dan Mas Denny Zailani. Thank you for your support, KBRI Washington, D.C. We could not have done this event without your support. And thank you for staying till the end as well. Um, so that brings us to the end of this event. Um, please, um, to all participants, if you have not, fill out our post-event survey. Um, the link is on the chat box below. If you did enjoy our event, please follow our social media on YouTube, on Instagram, on Facebook. To stay tuned for future events. All your questions have been, are with us now. We're going to get them to the speakers. They're not going anywhere. Um, we'll try to answer them in our post-event document. So thank you all for tuning in. Um, well, our next Going Global series is slated for February 2020. But in between then, we'll have lots of events, um, lots of um, Global Connect series, other events as well, um, until February 2020. So until next time, um, it's been a pleasure having all of you tonight. Thank you.